All right, hello everyone. This is uh, Jim Rizmitsis, and welcome to our session today. Um, I'm the general manager and founder of the 5G Open Innovation Lab here in Seattle, Washington, and it's a true pleasure to be here amongst our panelists. And so with that, what I'd like to do is introduce our panelists and have them introduce themselves. Uh, so first, we'll go with Ofer uh, Hakoen. Would you like to introduce yourself, Ofer? Hey everyone, my name is Ofa Cohen. I'm the head of the AT&T Innovation Center in Israel. Um, the focus is on creating value through innovation, uh, working closely with business units on one side and the ecosystem on the other, um, commercializing new technologies uh, in open innovation with startups, also doing uh, incubation of new ideas and then turning them into new services and new products. Um, very happy to be here. Excellent. Thank you, Ofer. I appreciate it. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Neil Cochran from Vodafone. Neil? Hello, everyone. So I'm Neil Cocker. Uh, I am co-founder and head of scouting at Tomorrow Street, which is a scale uh, and a joint venture between Vodafone and the Luxembourg government. And what we do is we have in, in Luxembourg, we have the Vodafone procurement company, which is a, Vodafone's centralized procurement function, which manages around 20 billion euros of spend. Uh, it's about 85, 90% of Vodafone's overall spend. And our accelerator locks into this procurement company to provide opportunities for the scale-ups that we partner with. So looking forward to the chat today. Thank you, Neil, appreciate it. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Miguel from NOS Telecom. Miguel. Hello, uh, thank you, first of all, for, your, for the invitation. Um, I'm Miguel Ibiguer. I'm responsible for the um, uh, B2B transformation and innovation uh, program uh, here at NORS. Uh, NORS is one of the, the three biggest play telecom uh, operators in Portugal, um, going through uh, wireline, uh, mobile, um, and now entering spaces like IoT, analytics, uh, of course, 5G. Uh, and we, 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 we tend to have a very, very close uh, um, relationship with, with the startups, incubators, accelerators, et cetera, uh, in order to uh, either to uh, internalize and, and to increase our portfolio of products and services, uh, or sometimes just to uh, overcome uh, some challenges of our D2B clients. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, um, Miguel, appreciate it. And then uh, last, I'd like to introduce uh, Amir from Swisscom. Amir? Yeah, um, hi everybody. Uh, Amir Pellet's my name. Uh, I am, um, I would say running B2B to C at Swisscom as part of the management team in our wholesale division. We've seen that, you know, B2B divisions don't always know how to sell to C's and B2C divisions certainly don't know how to sell to B's. And so there is this new space called B2B to C. Primarily, I look at partnerships with some of the large global OTTs, Spotify, Netflix, um, Apple, Google, um, Tinder, Dropbox, to name a few, and just kind of to give the diversity. Uh, we monetize these partnerships through um, billing facilities like our carrier billing product. We have a data business that I run where we basically share CRM and certain data um, from your phones and, and such. Um, in order to uh, expedite e-commerce checkouts, merchant services, um, so to say, and also to reduce fraud and, um, you know, friendly fraud and misunderstandings, uh, whatever that means. Um, in, in addition, I've got an infrastructure business around peering and transit. Uh, transit is just basically taking IP packets from other networks and transiting them on our, on our network, which is uh, where our eyeballs are connected to, our, our end users. And uh, we have a caching business as well that I run, which is uh, pretty much putting Netflix, Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and more content um, in our data centers and in our edge locations, which allow that um, digital service or subscription or interaction to be um, um, very, very fast, very seamless. Uh, we are, um, we've had 5G up and running since May 1990. 3% national coverage. We're a relatively small country. Um, we have a very good 5G network. We have a very good fiber network. And really, in a wholesale level, we sell to all the whole all the service providers in Switzerland buy something from us. Um, I've also got an innovation business where I work with some of the startups. Uh, we work a lot with our venture um, fund and our venture capital team 
There is a person responsible for Israel. Uh, our CEO was supposed to be in Israel last spring, right before the lockdown started. Unfortunately, that, that was postponed. Main interest in Israel is very much around cyber and what we call deep tech. We see ourselves as a deep tech country. So deep tech is things like um, AI, robotics, um, you know, VR, AR, these types of things. We're less of a IT country. And so I look forward to today and thank you for having me. Thank you, Amir. Appreciate it. And before we get into the conversation, um, I, I wanted to share a little bit about what we're doing at the 5G Lab here in Seattle. We focus on building an, an ecosystem of software startups so you actually can run applications for enterprises um, on top of telco networks. And we're backed by uh, partnerships, including T-Mobile here in the United States, Microsoft, Dell, VMware, NASA, Amdocs, um, F5 Networks, uh, and others. And so with that, and given all of our panelists have worked with uh, startups, let's lead with a question around startup successes and failures. And specifically, um, as, as you've approached the startup innovation ecosystem for your businesses, what are examples of successful engagements that could help the, the startups who are listening in today navigate uh, this world? And then what are examples of engagements that maybe didn't fare out so well? I, well, I could start if it's okay. Sure, um, I think high level, um, um, we are unbelievably complex companies as an industry. Um, we are very difficult to work with, um, even at the NDA level sometimes. And the sales cycles are tremendously long. Startups that do not understand that and that don't have the resources to support the, the sales cycle probably should not get into beds with telcos and service providers. That's my first kind of disclaimer. Our big challenge, I think, is in, in introducing startups to, let's say, our B2B business. Our B2B business, uh, being the largest systems integrator in Switzerland, you know, works kind of on scale, right? They need, really, they work with vendors that can, you know, that they can put in their broader solutions and then just kind of send the several hundred or thousand sales guys and girls out there to sell. Sometimes they have a lot of difficulties working with small startups. And so it's very important that you have, I think, like we have innovation teams and kind of incubation teams and these different mechanisms to slowly introduce these, um, these startups to, uh, to, to us and to our, um, where the magic happens, so to say, our B2B, our B2C divisions. Um, working at Microsoft, I remember, you know, there's a lot of carcasses of startups outside the Microsoft, the Amazon, the Google, the the facebook offices and and we have to always be very careful as startups working with big companies um especially around our ip and protecting our ip and making sure that um you know it can't be easily copied stolen or bought somewhere else if that makes sense um so i think that's an important element but for me at the end of the day working with telcos is extremely complex if you don't have the capability to see an 18 to 24 month sales cycle through I would probably um, give you advice to go somewhere else and try your luck. By the way, banks aren't easier either, but um, that's just some of the challenges we find in our industry. And, and I just wanted to throw that out there. Sure. Neil, you were, um, yeah, looks like you wanted to say something as well. I agree with Amir completely because it's like, uh, I think for a startup coming into a telco operator, it's like entering this labyrinth. Uh, and those of us who are working in associated, you know, embedded accelerators, incubators, whatever, we are the navigators. That's, yeah. that's how we like to see ourselves. Um, and I agree with Amir completely, those long sales cycles. And this is where we've been going for three years uh, and we made a couple of mistakes in the early days because we took in companies that were too, too young, too early on their development cycle. Uh, and it put them under a lot of strain because, you know, they had fewer than, they had maybe around 30 employees. They couldn't really, they didn't have the bandwidth, the capacity to cope with uh, such a huge global organization as Vodafone. So since then, we've focused very much on advanced scale-ups. So mm -hmm. typically, they tend to have, you know, funding of 10, 20 million plus. Revenues maybe around the 10 million mark and employees of 100, 150 people. And we find that when they're at that stage, they, they have that capacity. They have some muscles already built up from, from working with many corporate clients. Uh, and that's a good sweet spot for us. And there's one company we work with called Site Tracker. Uh, and they had actually, they'd been working in Verizon and they came to our attention and they were looking to break into Europe. They have, they have a cloud, cloud platform for managing 
very complex infrastructure assets, base stations namely, uh, and, and we saw the opportunity to, to bring them into Vodafone, and that's been a, a successful partnership so far. Excellent. So, so Over. one more thing, I mean, to to add to to what the, my colleagues were, were saying, and, and they're spot on, right? But so I'll try to t tell it a little bit for more of a, like tips for startups rather than uh, scaring them away because they should, I mean, they should know what they're getting into. But, but the thing is, um, and, and large enterprises, um, and, and I think Neil you know, mentioned about uh, you know, the role of the innovators as navigators, really need to, startups need really to understand uh, several things um, about the enterprise. First of all, it's like, what do they want out of the deal? Like, why is they, are they looking for a design partnership early on? Maybe it's a good fit, maybe it's not. Are they looking for access to the market? Are they looking for um, the enterprise or a telco as their customer, like something, um, um, a customer's base that they can scale, right? It really have a really sharp understanding of why they want to even start working there. And once they have that understanding, you also need to have that understanding of who are the roles within the company, right? Within an enterprise. So you have, you know, decision makers, you have maybe a champion from the innovation. You can have customers, like the people who are actually acquiring the solution or marketing your solution. And you may have users who may be using your you know, technology and they might be different units, different business units. They might be, um, you know, continents apart in, in terms of the org structure. So the more you understand how the enterprise works, you have a better understanding of how to approach them and, and get out of that. Oh, we're so fast because we're a startup. It's easy to be fast when you're a startup when you don't have a huge brand and a lot of, uh, you know, customers that, you know, you're um, providing highly, you know, premium services that it's not just, you know, move fast and break things and let's see what happens, right? Um, and enterprise, especially telcos, there's also, you know, laws and regulations and whatnot that, that streamline certain activities in certain ways. And the more the startup understands how the enterprise works and what are the, 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 the processes, let's call it, that, you know, going into, um, there's a lot of questions that a startup can ask an enterprise and have that clarity and understanding of how to, you know, to Amir's point, how will the next, you know, 6, 18, 24, whatever month look like? Yeah. There's a lot of clarity yeah. to be made from both sides. May I just, Agreed. Uh, may Please, I just Miguel, add? yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah. Um, I, I, I totally agree with, the, with with everything that's been said, of course. Amir is totally right with the, uh, it's, it's a very complex, they are very complex uh, companies and enterprises. And I, I think one key for the startups is they have to be prepared. They have to be prepared uh, to make their pitch and to make the pitch to the right people. And uh, they are going to talk with a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, either legal, uh, product managers, uh, uh, CRM, a lot of people they are going to talk to. So they have to uh, address the, their pitch to the right people. And they have to be... Uh, uh, prepared to a, a timing that it's uh, not always what they want it to be. Um, and they have, uh, 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 they have to be aware that these companies are, uh, they don't live very well with uncertainties. They don't deal very well with the unclear return on investment. Uh, so it has to be very clear for the company, for, for the, the telco, to understand what is going to uh, uh, what what's in it for them, okay, um, and uh, and sometimes uh, uh, I know that this uh, perhaps this is a very Portuguese uh, uh, thing, but it's it's necessary to have a lot of empathy uh, uh, because otherwise, if you don't have empathy with the people that you are talking to, uh, it, it's going to be rough because they are the ones that they are going to have to sell your idea when you are not there. Um, and, um, and and be and be aware that um, 
to harm a, a company reputation, a company like this uh, reputation, it's 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 very uh, very complicated. So that's why the fear it's it's always there on, on the on this company side. So uh, just to to give these uh, inputs for for startups that want to start talking with the, with large companies like telcos for once and and banks like Amir said it, it's uh, they have to be prepared okay uh, but but it's it, when it when it re, when it uh, 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 when it uh, returns well when it ends well it's I think it's good for for everybody so do not give excellent I, yeah I love it when companies come to me and say look I want to talk to this person or that person or this line they've identified the buying center they've done their homework and they come say hey this or that person I need to talk to that shortens the cycle and helps me a lot that said it's still a timing game right at that point in time so I would urge all the startups do your homework don't randomize our time and we won't run we'll try not to randomize your time we probably will in any case right so i'm sorry to be a little bit cynical but um come prepared and then i think we can really help and and understand that these things take a long time sometimes but be persistent and stick to the you know stick to the plan and you'll make it eventually and at the end of the day we're very good customers to have it just takes a long time. We're very loyal customers, at least it's the Swiss comment for many years, our relationships with, with our vendors. <clears throat> Great, so um, we have a 20 minute Q&A and then we have in the next uh, three-ish minutes, we're gonna jump into um, some startup pitches. But before we do, um, all around the world, there's a lot of hype about what, what 5G is and what it could do. Maybe for the next three minutes, if I can ask each of the panelists, give us a one minute, what do you think 5G is and isn't? Uh, perspective, Amir. Uh, since you're, um, since Wiscom is already down the the road on this, I'd love to get your opinion on that. Well, 5G isn't a, a virus spreader of the Bill Gates chip or whatever <laughs> that is. So um, these things, it's definitely not. The, the truth is, look, 5G is an enabler. It's a, it's a game changer. It's a massive game changer. We will only start to realize these things a few years down the road. I look at things like VR, XR, AR. Um, XR kind of being the leading technology, um, GPU-based servers. We see our 5G towers defect, uh, de facto as an edge location. You can put a small computer there with um, compute and storage and you've got an edge. Um, there's unbelievable potential in what this infrastructure can do and we look forward to this exciting world. Um, I think what will help at the end of the day, adoption is several things. Uh, one, use cases, use cases, use cases, and they're coming. Uh, not only autonomous cars, uh, there's many, many other things, not only telemedicine or, you know, teleeducation or whatever it be, it's everything together. Two, I think the handsets need to support 5G. If you look at the new iPhone, we are an iPhone country and that's driving a lot of 5G adoption. When you're not using your phone to save battery, your iPhone switches to 4G. So there's these, sometimes these limitations that are set in this case by Apple, um, and some of the Android manufacturers as well that don't always allow us <laughs> to put all the endpoints on, on the network, which will evolve over time. That said, um, we know it's a good investment. Uh, we know it'll take time. The pipe is very big and open and we're looking for anybody that can help us fill that pipe with interesting use cases. Excellent, Miguel, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, uh, once again, totally agree. Uh, we don't know at this uh, at this moment in time what's going, wh what is 5G going to going to bring us. Uh, it's it's very early in time. We know that, of course, it's going to bring uh, a lot of uh, reduced latency. It's going to be a huge amount of data uh, speed. Um, but the the real use cases are not uh, uh, on on the table yet. And um, and we believe that. Uh, uh, at least at Noj, uh, we don't have the power to know it all. So uh, that's why we uh, are counting with the, with startups to help us see the future and uh, and see how uh, 5G can help uh, in specific use cases. Use cases are are everything. We are we are uh, investing a lot in 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 specific use cases, mainly in the B2B market for, for, uh, for, for startup. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we, we are not going to do this alone. We, we, we need the companies that, that can help us uh, and, and to uh, give some, some flashes of what may come. Thank you, Miguel. Neil? 
So I think probably five years ago, um, perhaps it was a little overhyped in the media. It was imagined as this big bang, you know, in, in, in the year 2020, this would be the huge thing that would change the world. And of course, something else changed the world in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what will happen is, you know, rather than the big bang, it's going to be application by application, use case by use case. And it's what the world is ready for. So for example, um, surgical robots, I think, you know, even if the technology is there at some point soon, um, the trust factor about, you know, can a surgical robot be hacked? Can we allow a surgical robot to perform something that's a matter of life or, life or death versus, say, this, you know, smart lock on your house or a smart speaker or, or, or such like. Uh, so I, I think it, it will come with time. Uh, and, and just as Amir said, it's use cases and applications, and it's like building up a, a level of trust and uh, just that momentum first. Thank you. And Ofer? So, so just to add to, to what was just said, look, 5G, is, from my perspective, um, personally, I think it's a game changer, right? It's, it's an enabler for so many things. If you look at the potential of 5G combined with beyond, you know, the you know, the, 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 the speed and the latency, if you add into that, um, you know, the IoT aspects that it can support, right? You know, you can have full, you know, digital twins, you know, industrial use cases. Um, you also have edge compute, which personally I think is the, is the key, you know, is, is a key point in, in 5G in that it allows you to do things that, you know, the high bandwidth throughput and the low latency in basically moving the compute from wherever there's a bottleneck into the edge in a way that you get both worlds. And, you know, I think there's so much potential to be unlocked there. I mean, we did a few, de um, a few demonstrations last year presented um, in, in several keynotes you know, showing how the use of um, edge compute can basically move um, solutions that require hardware, you know, in compute in the field all the way to the, to the edge in a way that changes models, business models from, you know, project-based to SaaS models, which is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, opening new uh, options for, for companies. So yeah, 5G is definitely going to be uh, huge. Wonderful. And I and totally agree with all of you. Thank you, panelists, for a great roundtable conversation. We're going to shift the program for the rest of our session to four pretty cool startup pitches. And so here's how it's going to go. We'll invite each of the startups up. They'll have four to five minutes to do a pitch. And then we will all have about two to three minutes to ask some Q&A before we move on to the next one. Since we've only got about 36 minutes left in our session today, I'm going to be pretty pretty hardcore about each of the time. So we have uh, enough time for the startups to, to do their pitches and get some clarifying Q&A. We'll move on to the next one. All right. And so with that, what I'd like to do is introduce Ziv from Pagalant to come up first. Ziv? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Awesome. The stage is yours, my friend. All right. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. My name is Ziv Cohen. I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Pagerland, which uh, specializes in uh, frictionless mobile payments fraud prevention. Uh, myself, my team, I mean, we come with a very strong background in cybersecurity and fraud. That's what uh, we've been doing uh, for the last 20 years or so, working with all sorts of organizations, telcos, banks, uh, e-commerce, and, uh, and of course, the last uh, few years also with uh, crypto. Um, so... Well, I think uh, it's really uh, needless to mention how fintech has disrupted the entire space with the way we pay, we bank, we transfer money. And this has to do with cashless, cardless, and of course, it's all mobile-based because that's where we are, that's what we uh, use. And this brings up a few challenges, uh, mainly two challenges that need to work together, but they contradict or they, they have contradicted so far. One is uh, tackling fraud. And fraud on mobile, and especially new types of mobile attacks, such as uh, new account fraud, fake accounts, account takeover, transaction fraud, and the list is uh, uh, getting longer and longer due to the sophistication of fraudsters. 
And this requires a different approach. It's very, very different from what we've done, for example, for online uh, banking with uh, malware and phishing. Here, it's not just three browsers, but it's endless number of manufacturers, over operating systems. You take Android and you build your own flavor on top of it. So it really opens up uh, various breaches and uh, new opportunities for fraudsters. And with that, of course, uh, everybody is looking at reducing the friction, which is associated with the uh, engagement of the user and the application. Uh, and this requires, again, a different approach, which replaces all the friction-based authentication methods, such as uh, OTP SMS, which again belongs to the past, pin codes, passwords, with another frictionless layer or a seamless layer that can authenticate strongly the customer without really interfering and without blocking legitimate transactions. And what we've actually, uh, what we did is uh, we designed a system which uh, perfectly fits the new FinTech space. And this uh, addresses more than these two points that I've mentioned. One is really tackling fraud, two is the frictionless authentication. But in addition to that, it's uh, looking at doing all this without breaching any privacy because privacy is a big issue nowadays, unlike you know, the situation in the past where we could just collect whatever we wanted without getting the consent or permissions from the user, that's not the case anymore. GDPR definitely has set the path for the entire world to follow with regard to what can be done and what cannot be done. And in addition to that, it's also the simplicity of the integration because implementation is another pain point. You all, you know, mentioned how difficult it is to work with telcos and so not just telcos, but also other enterprises. Uh, it's costly, it's lengthy, it requires lots of resources and processes from the organization to deploy a new system, especially anti-fraud system. So we have really simplified it to the extent that here is your app, link it to the box, and just simply get it all out of the box with no additional effort. Just a little bit uh, about what's under the hood. So the technology behind Pagerland includes six intelligent sets, which means that we'll take all the aspects into account that are related to the device so we can really create a, a strongly unique identifier per phone with all the challenges that Apple and Google are putting on the table uh, you know, over and over again, the difficulty to reach out and really uh, rely on some numbers related to the physical uh, chips and devices. Still, we've overcome this challenge and created a unique identifier that really overcome again all the tricks of the fraudsters when they use emulators and bots and machines and they try to reset the phone to factory default or do SIM swapping. That is all something that is covered by the system. And then we extended the device DNA, the unique identifier to also analyze the usage of the user on the device, uh, build all the activity maps and the behavioral biometrics around how the customers and fraudsters use the device biometrically, whether they hold it with the left hand, right hand, two hands, what's the force they put on the screen, how fast do they scroll, and taking all the spending habits into account as well. Where do we buy, how much, what's the account, the time, the uh, location, the amount, the merchant, etc. That's all ingested into our system to reach a point where we can really quickly in milliseconds uh, just generate this risk score and send it back. So it's a simple SDK with the ability to respond uh, very quickly with a very accurate uh, input of whether it's risky, safe. Based on that, you can make a decision of whether to approve or to decline the transaction. This is just a snapshot of a few of the customers uh, and companies worldwide already using PageLand uh, from Surf Telecom in Brazil, all the way to other verticals like banks and e-wallets and challenger banking, energy, mobility, and so forth. Global visibility is a key factor uh, for tackling fraud, and that's what we bring to the table. Well, I guess I have some more time, so maybe it's more time for questions. No, we have time for questions. Sorry, I was talking to my mute button for a moment. I'll open it up now <laughs> right. to the panelists for any Q&A. We'll give you two minutes. Thanks. Do we have questions? As of Neil from Tomorrow Street, um, just um, if you could expand a bit more on on the uniqueness and the competitive landscape, that would be really helpful. Yes, absolutely. So, um, first of all, when, when you're looking at uh, a mobile, it really requires different expertise and focus. Uh, the anti-fraud systems and solutions were mostly developed for web. That's what also you know. That's what I've been doing uh, before PagerLand. 
And uh, looking at web with browsers is very much different than really focusing on mobile. That, that's one thing. Secondly, looking at the uh, anti-fraud landscape, um, companies are only doing parts of this entire process and picture. For example, you can find many companies focusing on transaction view. That's like uh, legacy, right? Analyzing transaction data. But they miss all the other pieces that are related to identifying the device, the behavior of the person, looking at the application and analyzing the breaches of the application and so forth. So looking and getting like a complete picture really enables you to reach this accurate point where you can rely on uh, the decision uh, when you decline or accept a transaction or challenge a user. It also you know, occurs from time to time that a user needs to be challenged, but it's really all about uh, looking very broadly and analyzing various factors together rather than just looking uh, working in silos and then trying to connect the dots. Thank you. Um, yeah, my, my question would be, I mean, one, this is a topic close to my heart, uh, payments. Uh, obviously, payments not an emotional decision. Let's say the content of the service beneath it is probably the, the, the emotional element. We as a company, you know, under Swisscom Pay is basically an API or aggregation layer. We have carrier building as a product, but the rest we kind of partner, we aggregate payment methods. We don't compete with banks or credit card companies like um, other telcos, for example, Orange that bought online banks for exactly these types of reasons. Now, one challenge we have, of course, is regulation. Um, as always, the data on any digital transaction needs to stay within the borders of our country. If this is a SaaS-based solution, or is this a SaaS-based solution, or can it be on-prem? Um, would be my, my question. Okay, so uh, to start with, actually, when we started the company, we were lucky enough to, um, to be awarded by the European Commission and also receive a grant as part of Horizon 2020 uh, for the technology. So in addition to the 2 million euros that we received, we designed the system with you know, the European GDPR regulation in, in mind way before GDPR was even released to the market. It is a SaaS solution. Our operation runs in Europe, remains in Europe. Uh, for the European uh, uh, companies, it's actually in Frankfurt. So uh, no data leaves the continent, that's one. Secondly, with regard to the way that it works, all the information is fully vectorized, it's hashed, so that it cannot be reverse engineered. Uh, it's all encrypted end to end from the device in transit at rest. So from that perspective, we've really taken all the privacy uh, topics, you know, into consideration when we designed and developed this solution. Excellent. Ziv, thank you very much for your time today and the panelists for some great conversation and questions. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to move on to Sharon for the next uh, pitch. And so with that, Sharon from VHive, I'd invite you to come up and I'm coming pitch. Up just Awesome. Over. Okay, can you all see my, my, my slides? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, just let's wait then. There they go. Okay, because I can't see you. So thank you for <laughs> thank you, Jim, for introducing me. My name is Sharon. I'm leading. I'm the CMO of Beehive. Excited to be here and meet all of you virtually. Introduce the amazing company I'm part of. Well, uh, the, where we are, we're looking on the left hand side of the slide. You see a tower, a tower climber. Today, to inspect a tower, a uh, telco tower, uh, towers need to be inspected with tower climbers that climb very tall towers, take pictures with their cell phones, and perform measurements with a tape while putting themselves in danger. This process is complex, it takes long hours, and requires several field personnel to be on the site for safety reasons. And the data, at the end of the day, that the, the, the climbers generate is inconsistent and frequently requires additional visits to gather more information. And on the right-hand side is where we come in. We are talking about drones. Just to set the stage, I don't, I'm not sure that everyone know, knows what a drone is. It's a sophisticated robot that flies in the air and has a great camera on it. And what we are talking about is uh, drones are now an innovative enterprise capturing tool that anyone can use when needed. They generate high quality data in less time and less costs and keep the climber safe. So introducing VI, what do we do? Our software generates 3D digital twins, which is a digital representation of the field assets 
by enabling drones to collect high resolution imagery in an autonomous way, meaning that we can, uh, our software enables these drones just to fly in the sky, go around the asset, get, capture all the images, come back down, you upload the information to our system, and you are, you are free to inspect all the information through our software. So why should we use these drone towers with uh, drones? First of all, we can better capture revenue and what do we in the organization? And we have collaboration tools for shared views among multiple users and stakeholders within the... We can provide better field data and faster insights because our high resolution imagery is consistently captured by data acquisition algorithms. It's a faster workflow from data acquisition to insights and we can show changes over time. And moving on, we today support uh, any survey type. If you have a monopole, a lattice, a guy wire, a rooftop tower, any type of tower, our system knows how to support it. A survey can be executed by one drone or multiple drone. Uh, there are some sites that, uh, that have really immense towers. They go up with two or three drones. And then a uh, typical survey takes between a 30 to 45 minute uh, survey. And going back to the tower climbers that take an hour, you only need one person on site and he doesn't have to climb. He can drink his coffee while looking at his drone and the drone does the work for him. So let's talk about the use cases. Um, we have, uh, as you presented earlier in the panel, about the different uh, personas within organizations. We have identified working with the largest telcos in the world that there are multiple users for our systems. We have the engineering, uh, you know, say network side uh, that look at the 3D digital uh, um, twins, they can look at the precise measurements, understand the equipment, the geometry, the mechanics, the height, the tilt, the azimuth, uh, all the information appears uh, uh, on the 3D model. You can measure each and every panel. You can measure from the base to the tip of the tower. You can see all the information. Um, I, for towers, for rooftops, and others. For new 5G site acquisition and approvals, we, we provide a 360 virtual tour, a power, as we call a panoramic sphere, that you can throughout look at, move in the system and look at, at line of sight and check if are there any obstacles on the way. And this is very important for 360 site visualizations for new site planning and rapid approval processes with uh, regulators. Thank you, um, Sharon. Sorry, Sharon, interrupt. We just went over five minutes. I want to make oh, sure there was enough time for a Q&A. Okay. I apologize. And before yeah, we get into the Q&A, yeah, five minutes goes fast. Your slides yeah. were stuck on the title slide. So some of the panelists may have not seen the, the charts that you were talking through. So with wow, that, okay. yeah, we, we seem to have a bit of a bug with the platform, but I'll, I'll open it up for to the panelists for any questions. Um, we'll give you two minutes for Q&A. Sure. So I'm just going to stop sharing that. Thank you, Sharon. Sorry about that. Stuck. No worries. No worries. Sharon, I, I have a question, if sure. that's okay. Um, we, uh, you know, our ventures team invests in a company called Flyability that does on-site inspection. It's a, a Geneva-based company in Switzerland that also offers you know, site inspections using drones. We also invest in a robotics company, um, you know, like those uh, dog kind of animals you see in the Boston Dynamics movies. Uh, there is a company that does that in one of the universities that we invest in. And uh, we're trying to put both together. So um, um, kind of the, the bird's eye view of the drone together with the robot um, on the ground, if that makes sense, yeah. for site inspections and these things. Have you come across these kinds of things? Do you have these types of ambitions? Do you see this as necessary or do you have any partnerships in place for, um, you know, closing the loop with on the ground inspection, if that makes sense. I understand what you're talking about, Amir. Let me just uh, emphasize the ecosystem today is from the hardware, from the software, to the system integrators, there are a lot of players and there are each, there are so many companies that are niche players. We provide today from the data capturing through the processing, the analytics, and we call that insights because we can bring the whole value from working with customers worldwide uh, from the 
US and Europe and Asia, we haven't been uh, addressed for the walking dogs that you just mentioned. Uh, but because what I see with working with customers very closely that they ask for very much a line of sight and uh, 360 uh, views and exactly accurate, knowing exactly what inventory they have on their towers and change detection. We, you know, I'll just give you an example from last night. Um, a customer called and said, listen, from your system, I understand that three panels were removed and the five were added and we weren't billing our customers. Are you sure? It's like, of course I'm sure, it's reality. I just gave you a 3D model of what happens in an on-site. So uh, we see a lot of interest uh, in, in the analytics part today of this, getting the insights and getting the people uh, to understand that they can get so much information not moving from the desk in our virtual world today in this COVID uh, era. And we've seen numbers talking about 40% cut in the time uh, more assets uh, can be surveyed or 60% uh, survey uh, cost in, uh, uh, sorry, decrease in office and field costs from customers working with that. Excellent. Sharon, thank you so much for your time thank today. You guys. I'd well, love to go into more Q&A, but we're going to move on to David from Scream. Right. Thank you. Uh, David from Scream, the panel or the floor is yours, my friend. Great. Thank you very much. So, uh, first of all, um, I'd like to, you all to remember three things, and I think, Amir, you mentioned all three of these. One is massive, one is groundbreaking, and um, the third one is GPUs. So, I, I saw this yesterday, and I thought it would be very appropriate uh, for Mobile uh, World Live, and this is uh, one of your colleagues at Orange saying that growing, that data traffic is growing at a rate of 40% a year. And there's a significant growth of data with 5G, and it's going to unlock many opportunities. So I have a lot of war scars because, as you discussed in your session, uh, we have already customers in Telcom. They took a lot of time to get there, <laughs> but we got there. Uh, we have a data analytics acceleration platform for handling massive data, driving game-changing insights and value. And I didn't create this during your session. Um, and actually, it all runs on GPUs. So those are the three things, massive data, uh, game changing, and GPUs. So three use cases, and then a little bit about the technology. This one is LGU Plus in Korea. And here we were able to increase the amount of data analyzed by orders of magnitude, going from 60 terabytes up to half a petabyte, and they're growing. We started with one use case, which was for network quality. And now we've gone through the cyber departments. We're working with... Uh, the finance departments, it's basically uh, running through this uh, particular area of LG, uh, the subsidiary, and now we're talking also to the mother company. In AIS, which is Thailand's largest mobile operator, they had a lot of issues with handling things like ad personalization in Bangkok. There are many, many people there. They wanted to segment it according to demographics, being able to hit the students you know, when they were out in the evenings, um, being able to hit the older people where they were, and so on and so forth. We, we help them to reduce reporting times from two hours to 10 minutes, again, using data acceleration on GPU. Load time, the ingest was reduced from six hours to 20 minutes, and one GPU server replaced five racks of 7,600 CPU cores for those of you who are interested in uh, green technology. Um, Telcom in Israel, they had a serious issue with call dropping, and we were able to help to reduce dropped calls by 90%. 33 billion rows scanned in seconds. So I can send you these and we can go into them a lot more in detail if uh, you're interested in a you know, subsequent uh, discussion. So we have a data acceleration platform that was built for massive data analytics, powered by GPUs, very small footprint. We have lightning fast um, ingest of three terabytes per hour per GPU. So eight GPUs, that's 24 terabytes per hour. Massively scalable. We're working today with companies that are running data over petabytes of data. Um, it's very, uh, it's integrated very easily into your existing data pipeline, and that it doesn't matter whether you're running on premise, on the cloud, or at the edge. We can work with you. So there's another uh, word that has come up: the edge. It's extremely important in 5G, and we realize that as well. And you can integrate us into your data pipeline, feed the data through Stream. We do the heavy. Uh, data crunching, enabling you to analyze a lot more data, a lot more quickly, uh, more frequencies, and more dimensions. Um, last but not least, um, even the Gartner Group uh, knows who we are, 
And in January, they said that Scream is architected, yes, massive data stores. So when we're looking at the growth of data in telecom, and it's no surprise that actually our best market to date is in the telecom market. So we, as I said, we have the war scars already. Uh, we know how to work with telecom. It does take time. I think we're getting better at it because we have the experience already with working with a lot of you. Um, and a little bit about the company. Uh, we're growing very fast. Uh, we are over 100 employees. We did a $39 million Series B plus in June. We have strategic partnerships with Alibaba Cloud. We're actually working now with Microsoft, uh, Azure with Google Cloud, with uh, AWS, NVIDIA, of course, for the GPUs and some of the other providers. We have a local presence in the UK, in France, in the Nordics, in South Korea, and our R&D center is in Tel Aviv. That is, that is a great presentation, David. Thank you for, for uh, hitting all the points. I'd like to open it up for two minutes of Q&A, and then we'll move on to our last presentation. I mean, I, I can start. I mean, thank you very much. Um, you know, on, uh, honestly, Scream is a very interesting company. They're, they're actually on uh, a list of our venture fund, um, you know, for being monitored, which means um, certainly uh, in, in their own quiet way, they've, they've made a lot of progress and they're the real deal, if that makes sense. And so um, um, thank you for that. I think, again, similarly here, our biggest concern around data is, is confidentiality, is keeping the data within our country, our environment, our data centers, our ecosystem, whatever that means. I think these are the big challenges we have working with external providers um, in a SaaS model. What we don't, we're not GDPR, we are GDPR compliant, but we're not part of the EU, so we don't have to be. Um, that said, Switzerland is becoming a data hub for, you know, a data center kind of, um, um, like it was a center for banking and other things in the past. Um, you know, the question is, is similar to the previous question, can you guys run on-prem? Is this something that we can deploy? And I think for us as telcos, what would be very interesting is the services capabilities we have in partnering with you guys, David. So we make money on selling headcount heads, basically, consultancy services. Um, whereas in our reselling businesses, we, you know, we see, you know, high single digit, low double digit margins, which, you know, long term as a telco doesn't really allow us to kind of um, um, make it in the future, if that makes sense. So what are the opportunities to partner around services and what are your solutions, again, to main, uh, doing kind of on-prem solutions in the case where we have to have all the data geogra geographically bound within somewhere? Okay, so first off, uh, we started out as an on-prem company. Those three use cases are all examples of on-prem. Uh, we okay. can also run on cloud, and because we're running on cloud today, bare metal, uh, that can be done locally inside of your country. Uh, with regards to the services, that's an interesting question. Uh, we're partnering with various com companies uh, local, and it is definitely a model that we're open for. And I think a side discussion would be definitely worthwhile to see uh, you know, if there's room for collaboration. Great, thank you. Excellent. One last question before we move on to our last presentation. David, does, does it require re-architecting existing, you know, data pipelines? So uh, it might require, um, depending on the queries and how they are built, it might require fine-tuning them a little bit. Uh, but uh, for the most part, you don't have to do anything to them. Uh, we run standard SQL and CSQL. Uh, we want, we have an underlying columnar database, GPU database. So for the most part, no, um, but, uh, there could be some fine tuning, uh, just to make it run even faster than it would, uh, you know, if you brought it in native into the, uh, system. So basically the onboardings is supposed to be, um, quick on ramp. Ab absolutely. Excellent. Thank you, David, for a great presentation and to the panel, uh, panelists again for a great uh, set of questions. I'd like to uh, now turn it over to uh, a C from Con uh, Continual, which will be our last presentation for today. You have the floor, my friend. Thank you very much, guys. Hi, Asaf from Continual. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for uh, sitting in for my last session. Um, I'm not sure if you are able to see the presentation that I'm sharing with you. Just nod your head we if you are. We are now, yeah. 
<laughs> okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be uh, focusing on what the company does. Uh, that is the connected mobility, and in more uh, specifics, it is about knowing the mobility, the connected mobility experience. That is the that is so because uh, the experience when you're on route, in commute, in transit is not the same as the experience when you're stationary in your office at home or somewhere else. Uh, and the main use cases that drive the adoption of looking at what the roads and the highways look like from network perspective, the main use cases are the CV2X, that's the cellular vehicle to everything, right? Mercedes, just as examples, Mercedes-Benz uh, updating the software in its infotainment system over the air that requires massive pipes. Uh, Ford is also delivering now huge screens, right? As Americans would probably have it, huge, not big, huge. And that would be for a great HD experience in the car. And Tesla adding the Disney Plus. Um, and even down the road, the autonomous driving, the common thread around this is uh, the, the dependency, uh, not on everything, but on most of the part, the dependency on what the network can actually afford on the roads, and that is the emphasis here. But even if you're not thinking just mobile um, auto, uh, automotive, right? Some markets are not there yet. Um, those markets are still, those operators in the markets should be and are already investing certain efforts in uh, streamlining the network performance along the roads and along the highways um, for the simple reason of customer experience. And also, by the way, the fact that some third-party benchmarks are created every year or sometimes every quarter. Uh, those in Europe are probably familiar with the P3 umlaut network tests. Some examples are shown here. Uh, they practically have your customer experience uh, either a shine or shamed uh, in that network report. So the operators already have the motivation to spend uh, on monitoring systems and on monitoring techniques um, to look into what the roads, what the highways, and what the railways perform like. Uh, this is an example that uh, we are using or that we have shown carriers that we work with. This is a, an example of one of the main highways in Ireland. Uh, if you haven't seen this uh, animated, it's actually uh, because of perhaps the network latency here, but it shows that throughout the day, the latency um, the throughputs actually in this uh, example, but any other KPI or key quality indicator for those that have traveled that highway changes, changes by the location, changes by the day. This is uh, in fact measured by Continual as we worked to also show what the OEM experience, what the automotive OEM experience of the passengers would be like had the car been connected on that operator's uh, network facilities. So in short, we are offering carriers uh, a, a, a perhaps a, a, a leverage on their current investments in the latest technologies, 5G being the latest, uh, offer the best shaped network for commuters, for passengers, whether they are autos, cars, autonomous, connected or simply subscribers on the move. And we're also offering on the same platform the autonomous and the connected car manufacturers the best experience that could be delivered to the cars and passengers. Uh, it looks like that. So we scan through the existing data sets of the operators. Uh, much in depth about that, but from an hour, a few hours of uh, data that we crunch, we're able to produce uh, multi-dimensional maps, dimensions as if multiple KPIs, multiple key quality indicators. You're seeing here a, an example from a Vodafone on the left, a Vodafone market, um, because we have a, a pretty extensive uh, relationship with Vodafone, high meal. Um, on the right side, this is the US, maybe that would be interesting for you, Jim, too. Um, but in every operator that we work with, the entire nationwide country roads railways and highways are scanned by us and we give the engineering teams the tools to map in high and in extreme accuracy what the travel experience was like versus what the cell infrastructure was like and that many-to-many -many relationship is the essence of what we do the opportunity to analyze and also to optimize automatically those insights inside the network so 
Um, to wrap up the offering here that we have, the main one that carriers start with is the ability to analyze the journey through journey analytics and optimize it through our mobility experience optimization, which integrates into the current SON and optimization infrastructure. SON standing for self-organizing network. Uh, since we're here in the B2B segment of the conference, I'd also like to make a point that this is there's a solution based on the same platform for looking at the enterprise affiliated connections, um, whether they're handsets of all, the entire employee um, or the IoT devices or both, uh, and paint a complete picture of experience for those employees, whether they're at home or in the work facilities, and more so if they're on commute. And this is especially important for transportation, uh, businesses, delivery, couriers, fleets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, two additional solutions on the same platform, and that will be my last sentence. Uh, it is a sensitive area where you enrich the subscriber profile with, with where, um, what has happened to the subscriber upon the travel, what has been his experience. But this does amplify the visibility into uh, customer care, proactive one for subscribers, especially as you roll out your 5G and you know you're going to be flooded with um, certain subscribers that are paying uh, high amounts for their pay, for their plan, but are not that uh, excited with what they're getting. So customer profiles for care, but also for segmenting the customer base better. And the last but not the least, the opportunity to monetize these huge amounts of data as we paint the, tra the travel journeys of millions of subscribers uh, without looking at the identity, but rather with anonymization uh, and also aggregation of this data, this is um, thought, sought after by many businesses that need to plan their operations, transportation routes, uh, road improvements, smart cities. Those are the uh, prime candidates for that third part, uh, as third parties for that data that operators anyway have. I think I had it. Uh, rep just in time for questions. Thank you, sir. Right? Yes, well done. Well done. I'll open it up for some two minutes of Q&A, and then we're going to wrap up our session. Thank you, SF. Great. Hi, SF. Let me just understand. You do this uh, through only through data that's uh, available in the network, or do you have uh, uh, end devices on uh, any place? How, how does that work? We're mainly dependent, and we mainly de uh, we do most of the magic that you've shown that we've shown here on your CDRs. That's uh, the core network data elements, right, off of the switching elements. Um, but customers are often, when they see that, they also enrich our platform with the trace information from uh, the geolocation platforms that you have with probe data. If you have that, that's not always available 24 seven because it's very voluminous. And by the way, operators like Vodafone are also using their crowdsourced applications. So, but we don't have the footprint on the device. Whatever they get from their existing footprint of users that have adopted and gave the consent to the app, not our app, but the Vodafone app, that's data set that enriches our platform. The common denominator is the subscriber identification that allows us to map those uh, events and paint and replot the exact journeys that they've traveled on. Make sense? Yeah. Good. Last question. Amir, sorry, you're on. I think you're on mute, my friend. Amir, you're on mute. Amir, you're on mute. Um, so my question would be, you know, you see, you know, service providers or telcos as, as a B2B customer here in many ways. And we are. Okay, I get it. The, 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 the interesting model, I think, is, uh, 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 you know, a two street model, whereas we would consume and procure and utilize your data while you utilize our data and we have an abundance of it. Um, and through that, I think you can provide the rest of the ecosystem or we can provide with you to, to the rest of the ecosystem, a richer data set. So my question is our own data, our CRM data, our network data, or whatever data, have you thought of partnering here in that capacity because I think together it's a it's a differentiator um, from from the rest of the field Amir it's an interesting business model which I'll be very honest we haven't actually uh, even thought of um, we are a young startup and we you know we're trying to mostly do the cookie cutting yeah. scenarios where we don't invest too much in deviating from 
with our platform. So uh, I'd love to pick it up with you, but we, uh, I'll be very honest, we haven't done that. We're entirely reliant on your data to provide you with that extra value and the extra insights. That has been the model so far. I'd love to pick up and hear more thoughts. This is too yeah. short to understand exactly the model that you had, man. If you'd like to reach out, yes. I'm happy to, uh, to listen to what you had. Super, about. thank you. Excellent. And so with that, I think we may have gone over just a little bit, but it was well worth it. The quality of the of the startups, I think, and the pitches was fantastic. And of course, the questions as well. And so with that, I think we're going to conclude our session today. I wanted to give the panelists a heartfelt thank you for your time today and sharing your insights. It was great to learn from you all. And then, of course, for the startups with any types of these pitches, you know, five minutes feels like too little time and too much time all in one, but you did a great job of delivering some great pitches and answering the Q&A. Uh, so for anyone who was listening today, thank you so much for your time and for being part of today's session. We appreciate it. And to everyone involved, thank you again as well and have a good rest of your, your day. Thank you. Thanks, thank Cheers, you very guys. much. Bye. Bye-bye.